So let me say a little bit about the Hurleys here. First of all, this was the fourth lighthouse that they had lived at. When Dennis Hurley was born, his father was an assistant lighthouse keeper at Cape Point. And then subsequently the family moved to Robben Island, where he was again assistant lighthouse keeper. And that's where he started his primary schooling. The little school is still there, the little primary school on Robben Island. And Archbishop Hurley liked to say to Nelson Mandela, I was on Robben Island long before you were. <laughs> so, so how many people lived on the island at that time? Enough to... Yes, yes, about a thousand people I think there were, yes, yes. What were they doing there? Well, it was a prison. It was um, a, a leprosy colony. I, I so think now, when was the prison established there? Very early on. I don't know, yeah, very early on, yeah. It only became a political prison later on. Yeah. So then the third lighthouse they were at was at East London, and this was the fourth. And this was when Dennis Hurley Sr. became a, a full lighthouse keeper for the first time in 1924. But this is, was, is an extremely lonely place, as you can see. And the only three adults who were here were Dennis Hurley Sr. and his wife Teresa, and the assistant lighthouse keeper. And of course, when the children went away to school, to boarding school, either at Mzumbi convent down the coast or at Newcastle, it must have been even lonelier for them. So that was one of the problems for the family. Another problem was to find schools. And Teresa Hurley, who was a very get up and go kind of person, went up and down the coast looking for a school and she discovered this little school at Mzumbi convent. They had never had boarders before, but by the time she was finished with the nuns, they had two little boarders, <laughs> Dennis and his sister Eileen. And they actually lived in the convent for a couple of years. So an amazing experience for young children and clearly something that must have influenced them a lot. So were the Hurleys the senior Hurleys, also Catholics. Oh yes, absolutely, Irish Catholics. Once when, when Dennis Hurley was asked at the Robben Island School, you know, they were filling in forms for each child. He was asked, what, relig what church do you belong to? He said, Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Just to show you how I think the, uh, you know, the um, Hurleys would have been affected by the children going to school as far away as Newcastle. They had to catch two trains, one train to Durban and then from Durban to Newcastle. On the Durban station, he noticed that his father wept as they were leaving. And it was a kind of indication to him, you know, how lonely they, they were for those years. So and what age was, was Dennis Hurley when he went to boarding school in Newcastle? Uh, he was going into standard six, I think. About 13. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Um, this place, as I say, was very isolated, surrounded by trees and bush, inhabited by monkeys and snakes, also antelope, bushbuck, dikers, and a tiny buck called Ipiti in Zulu. And it was during this time when Dennis Hurley was at the Newcastle School for Boys, the Dominican school, that he was lost in a cave for nearly 24 hours with two other boys. So this was another trauma that happened during this time. But the worst trauma of all was the fact that his father had a breakdown and had to go to a hospital in Pretoria for 18 months and they really didn't know when he was coming home. So Teresa was left with four young children all of them at boarding school, no house to live in because they had lived here as lighthouse keeper. He was boarded now. He had a minor, a, a small pension. And I think were it not for the church, which in various ways helped him, they would have been very badly off. So I think that was an experience which shaped him for life, I would say. You know, people all say that he was always someone who would never say no to people who came to him 
with their problems because he knew what it was like to be in a very difficult situation as their family had been. So in a way this was quite a sad place I think for the Hurleys but, but a, a place that had a big influence on the children and of course Teresa was a very formidable person and she helped the family to rise above this crisis and the father did come back uh, to, to live with them and he had various jobs after that but um, it, I think it was always a difficult situation. Um, hi everybody, I'm Michaela York. Raymond, I have to introduce myself. I was a Hurley, we share a bond. My grandfather was Dennis Hurley and obviously Archbishop was my uncle. So we share a bond um, with lighthouses. So before, it is my privilege and my honour to thank you. Thank you for sharing those details and a bit of the history. Um, as I said, there is a special significance for myself and the Hurleys with lighthouses. So thank you for all of that information. Um, but I did ask Paddy, and I don't want to repeat what he said, but my father was Chris Hurley, the youngest of the Hurley children, and he did write his memoirs, which are still to be published, and I found these. So I'd like to read The Dad's Story, Chapter 1. I won't go on too long, Paddy. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to share these extracts from my father's memoirs to give an idea of Dennis Hurley's early family life here and the bond between a younger brother and an idolized and much loved and much missed older brother. My mother told me that I was born at 12.15 a.m. on the 7th of February 1922 in a house adjacent to the lighthouse on Robin Island where my father was a keeper. It was a birth date I share with St. Thomas More, 1478, Charles Dickens, 1812, and Dmitry Ivanovich Mendeleev, 1834. For those who are scientific, he was the guy who discovered and finalized the periodic table. It was only when my father was keeper at Greenpoint, Clanstall, on the Natal South Coast that my memory gives me a picture of the lighthouse where we lived until 1930. Clanstall is a halt on the ra railway line from Durban to Port Shepston. The Place Names Commission in 1952 tried to correct the name to Clausdall, but this was not accepted by many old residents who eventually succeeded in having the old name restored. The name had come from a German who called his farm Clausdall, the valley of Klaus as in Sa Santa Claus. The lighthouse warned shipping off the Alliwell Shoal I'm not sure if these details are correct. 1.6 kilometers long and 800 meters wide. Poetic license. <laughs> and four kilometers offshore. It was named after a ship which in 1849 narrowly missed colliding with it. At least one ship racing another to get the last berth in crowded Durban Harbour is a wreck there. I can remember being allowed to ride on the rotating part of the light seeing the weights being wound up and realizing the importance of the lights being kept burning. It was fueled by paraffin, kerosene, as there was no electricity supply. The sun had to be prevented from shining on the prisms by curtains. My mother had the contract to sew those curtains on her Singer sewing machine and I turned the handle always as fast as I could admiring the deftness of her fingers. Sometimes the family rosary was said in a room where my father could watch the light. On one occasion, when it did fail, the word interjected into the prayers by my father would not have been approved by any <laughs> liturgist. Even the telephone was a source of wonder to me. They were bucked to see at night, they were considered fair game and hunted. Most of all, I developed a healthy respect for snakes, puff adders, night adders, and mambas. There were monkeys in the bush as well. Occasionally, a thieving one would be shot and buried for some reason at the base of a pawpaw tree. Our groceries from Durban were offloaded at the railway halt and brought up to the house on a sled drawn by oxen, the short track through the bush having been cut by my father. 
When we returned at night from Durban, our way up this track was lit by a hurricane lantern which cast strange shadows on the bush off my father's moving legs. When Jerry and I went to boarding school in 1925, I teamed up with the son of the other keeper, Leslie Gray. Leslie Gray and I became close friends and were inevitably involved in some mischief. Eileen and Dennis seemed very grown up. Their names were always linked to going to school, either at St. Almo's or Zombie Primary, or at their respective schools in Newcastle, their secondary schools. Lighthouses that light ships and guide them to safety. And someone told me many years ago, Heavenly Father, that the darkest spot at the lighthouse is at the foot of the lighthouse. The, the, the lighthouse shines all around. And, the, and, and Dennis Hurley's light continues to shine throughout South Africa and through the world. And we thank you for his witness and for his life and his dedication. And we thank you through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.